PRX and FTVN Series 2, uh, new features, uh, new and updated features, which I think a lot of you guys will like. Um, and piping, what I like to call uh, different strokes for different folks. And uh, we're going to get in some larger applications where we have a lot of domestic hot water needed uh, and different ways that I do things um, just to show you guys what to do. Um, of course, you can talk to a dozen people and get a dozen different answers. Um, I've only been designing for 40 years. Um, and so far, I haven't had any of them come back to me and say they don't work. So I don't want you to be <laughs> I don't want you to be at first. <laughs> You're dick. Um, anyway, so the original, the OG, TRX. There it is, the TRX 85, 120, and the 110 and 150 combis, which are smaller ones. And here's the new one. I just want to point out here on the new one, look, folks, you've been asking for clips. We got clips. You take the two shipping screws out, and you just have to use the two clips at the bottom. That's a godsend. I don't know if, if you feel that way, but I think it's awesome. Um, then on larger ones, the one, yep, the 150, uh, 199 and 199C in the FTVN, I mean, on TRX and all the FTVNs, uh, the OG looked like the one I just came up, and here's the new one. Um, not much changes, except for it is an inch deeper, and you need to know that the piping actually comes out away from the wall another inch from the OGs. So if you're replacing an OG with a series two, you are gonna have to do, unfortunately, you're gonna have to move the header out or move your pipes out about an inch. So don't take that personally. I had nothing to do with it. I found that out the other day from one of our friends up in Canada. All right, so the displays. Here's the OG on the left and the new one on the right, the series two on the right. I wanna point out a couple things. Still has a menu button on both, right? Both of them still have menu buttons, but there's no longer, this was a long press. If you notice the five seconds for long press to get into doing the quick start on this one, you just press menu and it takes you right to the, um, uh, right to the, the um, startup wizard. Now I will say this, the first time you push it, the lights will get brighter. That's just waking it up. And then you have to push it a second time to get into where you want to be. Now, I want to point out one more thing. Notice how the PSI is listed on the front. That's because we got rid of the pressure switch, which we all so much loved. And we've now gone to a pressure sensor, which is A, much more accurate. B, don't even compare the pressure sensor that we, the pressure gauge that we give you because, well, that's a ask, that's an ASME standard. I have to give that to you with every boiler but this is much more accurate. You cannot compare a $50 uh, sensor to a, to a $5 gauge. You just can't do it. So, um, so that's one of the pluses on the front. Plus it's showing you now on the front, instead of five little bars, it actually shows you the power percentage. And this one showed you the outlet temperature. We still show you the outlet temperature, but now we show you the target temperature. And instead of putting a little block around either a faucet or a radiator, we tell you what the demand is right here right so a lot of new features that come up on the screen that we all have fallen in love with with past boilers that's now on this one and now the high voltage board so here's the one that we all loved on series one here's the one on series two i don't oh, wait that. a minute there's a there's actually there's actually on the series two there's actually a wiring diagram on it isn't that amazing now wait a minute here's the inside of the OG and here's the inside on the series two now you will notice on the series one we had a central heat pump and a domestic hot water pump output but we had two zone inputs hmm but there wasn't two circulator outputs well now we still have the two zone inputs but now zone one and zone two both have dry contacts that you can connect to. We still have the central heat pump and the domestic hot water pump, but we give you jumpers if you want to run circulators, two zones of circulators. We give you a jumper to go from power here and bring it over to zone two and a little jumper to go from here to here. So if you want to run circulators, you can. Of course, if you have more than two zones, you're still getting a relay like a nice Takeo SR506 and still running the end switch just down to zone one. 
Steve, I have I have to go back to have... your little, go back to your picture about the old control. There was a wire diagram on that older boiler that I don't have that control. It was just on the other side of the cover. Nobody really knew where it was at. It was, we were hiding it from you. We were hiding it from you. Okay. Anyway, it it's not on any mind, but I'll take your word for it. So anyway, you got older models. A lot of people, when we didn't have domestic water on a heat only boiler, we asked you to give it a call for heat and lock the boiler into the heating only position on the stepper valve. Let the stepper valve travel up the heat and let it go. Well, now it's a bit different because now in your quick startup, in the, in the startup wizard, it gives you six choices for domestic hot water. And one of them is no domestic hot water. When you select on a heating only unit, no domestic hot water, it automatically locks the stepper valve into the heat only position. And you can tell that by going to the tech menu, clicking enter on this, going to the event, go running down to DHW, go to the advanced settings in DHW, go to CH force diverter position, which here says on, and then look at it and says max value one. And if you read the manual, RTFM first says zero allows it to travel up and down. One says I'm locking you in the heat only and you're done. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's one of the coolest features. I found out the other day that when you choose no domestic hot water on the on the quick on the startup wizard, it automatically locks the valve into the heating only position. And that's cool. That is cool because anyway. that was one of our reasons for pump failures. Because nobody would do that. Well, not just pump failures, but delay in getting heat or over pressurizing the boiler and blowing the relief valve because the pump starts in the domestic hot water mode. And if it can't go anywhere, it increases the pressure and can blow the relief valve. That's a great slide for you. So anyway, we also have that exact same thing almost uh, in a video on our NTI training um, YouTube channel. So anyway. Let's get, into, let's get into some piping practices. So it's 20 after, I'm right on time. That's pretty cool that we, we're getting this done. Um, I wanna go over the beginning of primary secondary circulation. And I, I'm doing this for a reason. We, um, I designed a system with, with one of our contractors, one of our good contractors. And I did it slightly different to one, save wiring, two, save controls, and three, make it easy to troubleshoot and service. And still provide everything that the customer needed. And it got posted on, on Facebook. And the people on Facebook, or a person on Facebook, decided that he wanted to crucify everything that we had done, which I thought was pretty funny because apparently this guy doesn't know goddamn hydronics. So I just want to start here with a little pre-emblem, go through some of the piping that we've done over the years, just so that you know, and we're gonna go through this. We're gonna do basic, we're gonna go into primary, secondary, how we started it with cast iron boilers, and then we're gonna go into it with condensing, and then we're gonna go into it multiple boilers with high demands of domestic hot water. Anyway, here is our boiler. Here's an atmosphere cast iron boiler, a ceiling expansion tank, a cast iron air scoop, fill valve and circulators on the return. We have changed so much since then because we now know that the circulators have to be on the supply pumping away from the expansion tank. We've gotten rid of ceiling expansion tanks so we know got flooded because of gravity. Hot water would go up and when you heat water, the solubility of a gas goes out. So the gas comes out of solution, the hot water goes up the pipe as it expands, the cold water comes back down the pipe. But while the hot water goes up, it cools, it absorbs the air up here and brings it back down and goes off in the system. This is why these tanks get full of water. It's not because there's an air leak. It's because of gravity actually um, flooding them. Um, but anyway, we know not to pump to the boiler or to the expansion tank because a pump works by increasing pressure on the outlet and decreasing on the inlet. And we know that where the air is in the system is where there's the point of no pressure change. So here we have 12 pounds on an atmospheric system. We increased by seven, so now we got 19 pounds going through the boiler coming up to here. It gets the expansion tank, and now it drops. If it was seven pounds, seven from 12 is five. 
Now I'm five pounds here, less the static pressure of the house to come around to get back down to the system. This is just the wrong place to be. We can go through why we started doing this on a whole nother thing, or I'm gonna make a suggestion to buy a book called Pumping Away by Dan Hollihan. Um, best way ever, but here is the problem. We replaced these huge boilers that used to be coal-fired boilers, like what's in the basement of uh, Jason's house, this huge cast iron boiler, and we put in these little teeny weeny cast iron boilers, but we still had all this water out in the system. And what would happen is all that cold water coming back to the boiler, because the boiler couldn't get above 140 degrees, would condense and you'd actually break or crack or warp the back sections of these boilers. So what we did to combat that is we put in a simple bypass. That's all we did. We put in a simple bypass so the system could have one flow and the boiler could have another flow and everything was working coherently and the boiler could get up to 180 degrees and the system could come up slow and everything worked just lovely and we thought, oh boy, we solved the entire world. Um, I also show you that we've now changed to a diaphragm tank because we know they won't water lock because there's a diaphragm that uh, that separates the water from the air so it can't absorb it but i'll warn you of this we ask you to run 18 pound systems on condensing boilers we do this for multiple reasons but when you put an expansion tank in for those of you who are here and there's a lot of you here i'm going to tell you that whenever you get an expansion tank before you put it on the system Take your tire pressure gauge and make sure that the air where that little straighter valve is, the air on the air side of the diaphragm, is at system pressure. That's, That's right. right, system pressure. We call that That's hugging the expansion tank. Put it under your arm, get the straighter valve, take the cap off, and take your pressure gauge and hug it. Check that pressure because you know it's wrong. I guarantee you. When I owned a supply house, <laughs> I went out in my warehouse. I had a, I had a pallet of number 30 extrals the most popular extra in my neighborhood. And I tested all 30 and I ranged in pressure from three to 14 pounds. See? So if you're not checking the pressure, folks, See? If, if it's a three pounder and you're putting 18 pounds on the other side, you're gonna stretch that diaphragm so far it's gonna break. And you know, when the diaphragm breaks, somebody you're gets done. pregnant, you're going back. <laughs> so, pregnant. <laughs> anyway, good. so now, we wanted to go to outdoor reset with cast iron boilers, but a cast iron boiler we know if our return temperature is below 130 degrees is gonna condense. So we had to keep the boiler so it wouldn't condense. We had to get it above 140, 150 degrees, but we needed to supply the water out to the zones with outdoor reset, meaning as the temperature went down outside, the temperature going out from the boiler went up or vc versa as the temperature went up outside the temperature coming out of the boiler went down the system temperature went down so here we have a system where we have two closely spaced t's coming from the boiler there should be a circulator here but this is circulating when it comes on and then we have a circulator here this is where we came up with primary secondary we called this the primary loop here's the primary loop this is the boiler loop these were the zone loops or the system loops and what would happen is the pressure, the, the hot water would circulate around here. We had a sensor that we'd strap to the supply. We'd have a, usually a tech more control that said, hey, you know, this is the temperature I need. It would not turn this circulator on until the boiler was up to temperature. And if it turned it on, it made sure that because we had a temperature return going back to the boiler, that it wouldn't allow the boiler to get less than 130 degree return to protect the boiler from condensing. So here we got the circulation going round and round. We got the boiler going round and round. And then when the zones called, they went round and round and they got the temperature they needed to based on outdoor temperature. We used two closely spaced T's, that's four pipe diameters apart here, so that when the water came up to here, pump works by pressure differential, the circulator does, came up to here and it looked at the pressure of these two T's and said, ah, it's the same thing, keep on going. So this loop would keep on going until I dropped the pressure with this circulator, giving this zone the water it needed or this zone the water it needed or this zone the water it needed and because we we're running this circulator so fast the <laughs> difference in temperature between here and here was nearly minimal every zone got satisfied it was amazing and we saved the boiler we saved 14 percent on our fuel bills we gave you outdoor reset and everybody was happy and that's what we did in the original days of primary secondary which is why when you call me up and you say, my primary pump's not running. 
And I say, well, which one are you calling the primary? Because in a condensing boiler, we no longer have a primary loop because we don't need to protect the boiler because we want it to condense. So we don't have a primary loop on the boiler. So now you have circulator for the boiler, circulator for the zones, but there's no more primary loop here. You see how that works on a single, single boiler or dual boiler or eight boilers, and we don't need, we all sorts of ways to do it, but right here in this application where we have no domestic hot water going off this boiler. This is working just fine on straight out moose antlers, right? Moose antlers, two, two T's coming up from the boiler and off we go. Now, somebody said to me the other day, wheels, you talk about this four pipe diameters going to the boiler, but all your low loss headers are 14 inches. All of our boilers, if you buy a low loss header, they're 14 inches apart. They're as wide apart as the, as the pipes coming down from the boiler. And you're right. The reality of it is, is back here, on this zone, on this system, we didn't want this circulator here to create any flow on the boiler or any flow on these zones. But in this application, we don't care if we get a little bit more flow through here. We don't care. And it only increases the flow by about 5% by having the T's 14, 14 inches apart. So it's no big deal on a condensing boiler. It is a big deal on a primary loop going off the zones, but it's not because we're not heating the house with it. With, with the boiler. Nobody's gonna give a crap if the zones are running and the boiler's off and the boiler's getting a little bit of water coming from the zones. Nobody cares. Nobody's sitting there, nobody's getting hot. So you don't have to worry about it. So this is primary, secondary, way, the, the way we like to do it. Here's primary, secondary using zone valves, right? So now we have one pump and zone valves, which now we can use a Delta P pump and have a great time, save some energy on the zones and you know use use the, 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 the variable speed delta P or, or pressure delta difference in pressure pump that will increase the, the flow as each zone opens and decreases the flow as each zone closes. So you're saving energy on, on, a, on electric too, as well as on fuel. So there's a couple basics for you. So now let's go one step further, right? Let's go one step further. Let's add domestic hot water to it. So on a single zone application or a boiler, if we have multiple boilers and we only need the power of one boiler to make domestic, we do this where we have this circulator tied onto this, this central heat terminals of the boiler. We have this, this circulator tied onto the domestic hot water. These zones tied onto their own relay, the end switch coming down to the boiler, and what happens is when this is doing heat, it's just running fine. This pump's just running around, having a great time, giving your outdoor reset. You get a domestic hot water call. It turns this P1 pump off, tells the boiler to go to 180 degrees while it's turning on the domestic hot water pump. Now the domestic hot water gets flow going through the boiler, la, 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 la. When that's satisfied, this pump goes off. This pump comes back on. The boiler says, oh, back to outdoor reset, drops its temperature as it's flowing. These zones never shut off, it kept on going, and everybody's fine. So far, so good. Now let's get into some other kinds of systems. So here's an application where we're going to use a boiler pump and a domestic hot water pump going to a boiler when the heat's calling, this pump's running, injecting the heat into the loop for the heating. And when we need domestic, this pump goes off, this pump goes on. We go to 180 degrees, satisfy the, the indirect. And the indirect satisfied, turns this pump off, turns this pump on, it starts injecting through the two closely spaced T's to the loops going out to the system. And look, here we have a radiant heat zone at the very end. Oh, on two closely spaced T's because this pump is running, this zone valve opens and brings it around and mixes it so that the boiler's safe and the boiler's getting good even temperature so it can run nice. We're injecting that in, we're injecting the high temperature or higher temperatures into the rating heat and everybody's satisfied. We've done this for years. These are drawings I've had that I've made years ago that are working just perfectly fine. But now let's go to multiple boilers. So <laughs> I just read a, a note from somebody who says pumping waste should be required reading. Absolutely should be. 
Anyway, so here's multiple I, boilers away you know, one manufacturer done. I sent a link, Uncle Steve, to everybody that when you said pumping weight, I put the link where they can buy that book. They should buy it. Oh, thank you. So anyway, so here's a multiple boiler system back in the early days of condensing. And this was, I, I drew this up probably 15 years ago. We had multiple zones. We had eight zones or nine zones of, of high temperature heat going out. And, and, um, and we had an indirect water heater that needed to have a lot of power behind it. We used back then, or I used back then, a way I was taught by one manufacturer, which was the, the last supply will be the first return. Do you see this? So here's equidistant piping then. See, this is the last one. This is the, this is the last one. This is the first one. Off we go, and off we go to this boiler. And everything circulates around here, goes up to the two close to space T's. And as these zones call, it pulls it off. Now, on this circulator, we used a separate zone for the, for the domestic to tell the boilers to go to 180. Then we took the Z, the terminal for the central heat pump off the lead boiler, put a rib relay on it so it could handle the 20 amps of the circulators. And we ran that up to the ZC terminal on the zone panel and broke the power going to it so the circ these circulators couldn't get power while the indirect was running. This is a lot of wiring, a lot of crisscrossing, a lot of people didn't like it but it worked. It was the way we did it back then. So this satisfied the high amount of hot water we needed, turned off the zones using a, a rib relay and additional control on the boiler. Um, we broke the ZCZR breaker so that it didn't no longer had power. And when that came back on, we put the jumper back in ZCZR so that the, so that the circulators could run. Um, if you're not sure with the ZCZR, jumper is in zone in zone relays you'll see it next time you open it up you'll see the jumper there some now have a dip switch for it but the z is the power going to the relays that's always powering your thermostats and then that power that's going there is jumped over to the circulators to power the circulators if you break that jumper everything still stays on but the circulators no longer have power this is on all your relay controls that are out there so it worked it was just it was just the more controls and more wiring it was I eh, didn't like it so much. Anyway, so now we look at the TFTN, our new TFTN, which has three zones in each boiler. You can do up to six zones. So here we are cascaded with two boilers. So here's two boilers. We have six zones, no more than six, right? You can't have more than six. We can have an upstream where we're only using the power of one boiler to power the indirect or or downstream where we're using both boilers to power the indirects. Now, the upstream, when you cascade boilers, if you have an independent call for domestic hot water on the follower boiler, that's going to take care of the domestic while the other boiler, the manager boiler, is going to still provide heat to the system. So it's pretty cool to do. And these zones will shut off when the, when the domestic calls or this domestic calls. And when this domestic's done, the zones will come back on. Huh. So this is already done on the TFTN, but what happens when we have more than six zones? I mean, we can go back to rib relays. We can go back to using TACO con more TACO controls and the ZZZRs and wiring everything and running it all over the place. And some jackrabbit's gonna come in one day and just take that relay out, say, oh, the relay's busted. I can do it this way with a jumper and eh. It's just more trouble troubleshooting. So let's get into this a little further. Um, by the way, Tossi, the software that I use to do my drawings like this is a product called Visio, um, B-I-S-I-O. Uh, Visio is owned by Microsoft. Um, now, they weren't before. And if you ever want my stencil library, if you buy Visio and you want my stencil library, um, I have all sorts of stuff already done. Don't recreate the wheel. Just send me an email and ask me for the stencils and I will send them to you. So anyway, to answer that question. Um, now, here's a cast iron boiler, right? So here's a cast iron boiler at multiple zones. Here's my primary loop. Here's, 
here's my domestic, right? Here's my domestic loop. Here's my baseboard zones and my rating heat zone. And on this, we used a simple SR504. There's four zones, one, two, three, and four. We used an SR504, which is a Taco circulator relay. We put this on zone four for domestic and we gave it priority. So when we had a call for heat from the relay, it told the cast iron boiler to come on, turn the circulator on, got it rocking and rolling here. Primary loop went round and round and round and round and round. And when the indirect went on, it said, fine, let's just get it. And all the zones got the, after that turned off, all the other zones came on. What didn't we have? We didn't have outdoor reset with this. So then instead of the Taco relay, you could simply use, um, Tecmar actually makes a relay that would give you the priority and tell these zones when to go off. And now we use a Tecmar, a, a Tecmar relay to turn this on and turn the, let 180 degree up to the heat and get this injecting all the time. And when that was satisfied, we went back to outdoor reset and these zones got the outdoor reset. So a little convoluted, a lot of controls, a lot of expense, a lot of wiring, a lot of low voltage wiring, high voltage wiring. It was, um, it's just very intense. And when you went to troubleshoot it, eh, it wasn't so much fun. So now let's look at the next system. Let's look at the next system. In this system, I have eight zones of rating heat that were all plus or minus 10% from 120 degrees. So they ranged in temperature from 108 to 120. I had a snow melt system, which of course is going to require 135 degree water going out to the system, but I have to protect the boiler by going through the plate heat exchanger so the boilers can't freeze. And I needed both of these boilers to provide heat to the two indirect water heaters. So now I took the two boilers and I put them to a low loss header. Now, granted, two closely spaced T's would do the same thing, but I used what was called a SEP4, which had a magnetic uh, a filter in it, had a dirt and crap filter in it, had an air vent in it, so it replaced four things, hence the reason for SEP4. So I used that properly sized for these boilers. We still had a primary loop going round and round. This loop would only run on a call for heat and on a domestic hot water call for heat, this the circulator went off and the two S80s got temperature. And the boilers went to 180 degrees. When that was satisfied, this circulator went off, this circulator went on, these boilers went to outdoor reset. We sent the temperature over. I used an I-valve, which is fully independent. Um, it's full open throat. You size it for the flow of everything. Don't oversize it. Better, it's slightly undersized. This valve can open and close on its own to allow 100% through or regulate it down if it's too hot. Then we come back here. We have nice protection because we figured our flow rates here to have it enough. So we had a 20 degree delta T. We let this have a 35 degree delta T and have a great time out on the snow melt. The snow melt didn't get injured. The boiler was protected. We used a tech mark control for the snow melt to bring it up slow. We had this going on, so the boiler was protected and everybody was happy. Any questions on that so far? I'm assuming that a lot of you know, know at least that this is a circulator, this is a flow check, and this is a draw off, that these are boilers, right? So anyway, now let's get into a little bit bigger of a system. On this particular system, I had one high temperature zone of baseboard. I had two distinct temperatures of radiant heat, 140 and 120. See, that's more than 10%. And then I had snow melt. And I had a 120 gallon indirect, and I needed to have 500,000 BTU going to that S20 coil to make up for all the domestic hot water these people needed. Now note on this, on this system, there was no hydronic coils anywhere. The third floor baseboard was just that. It was the third floor had no radiant because it was a guest area. All the rest of the house was radiant heat in port floor. This system is now six years old. The people are static still. They love this system. So let's look at what we did. So here's my boiler power. I think everybody's familiar with the boiler power, two boilers, lead lag. Um, master slave, cascaded, um, leader follower, whatever you want to call it, right? 
politically correct, correct, I'm supposed to call it leader follow. We went to two closely spaced tees. I put the correct size mag filter, it's an inch and a half mag filter that could handle 50 gallon a minute on the zones. I had the right size floor mounted expansion tank and the fill valve with an air scoop. So upon call for heating, of course, this loop goes round and round and round based on outdoor reset. When the domestic calls, this pump goes off, this pump comes on, we satisfy the indirect water heater going to the low loss header, right? To this whole loop, right? It just goes round and round and around here. Boilers are having a great time. When this is satisfied, when the S20 is satisfied, the PL55 goes off, the Nerf 36 comes back on. We come around, we're doing the primary loop again for whatever calls. This third floor baseboard will always get 180 degree heat because of our flow rates. Temperature comes up to here. Eh, it's not even slightly because we're running a 20 degree delta T here. I have plenty of flow here because there's no head loss. So I'm using a Nerf 36, a small pump. So very little flow, very little head loss. So I'm just cranking it. Gets to here. Eh, it might be instead of 180, might be 175 or 78. Goes up to the mixing valve, mixing valve open and closes. That can circulate around here. Off it goes. Bypasses goes around. We have exactly 138 degrees on the coldest day. Keeps on going, comes back. I'm still of 178 degrees coming through here. These zones call with 120 degrees. Now I'm returning colder water, having a great time. I'm still mixing down. I'm still at 165 degrees coming off this. We need to have 135 going out to the snow melt, 138 degrees going to the snow melt. No big deal. We got, even if all zones are calling, I still have 175 degrees going out to this thing and everybody's having a great time playing in the right sandbox. And what do we save? Well, let's see. I had a, I had a control for this, which was a tech mar with, with, uh, with Wi-Fi. So we had a control for that. We had our zone controller out here for, for, the, for the eight zones out here. So we had two SR504s doing this. I had an SR506 doing this. I had an SR501 doing here on the third floor. No cascading controls for the boilers. No boiler protection out here. Everybody runs just fine. And there's the only wires you have running for low voltage are the boiler call from the Tecmar, the boiler call from the Radiant, and the boiler call from this zone and this zone, and everybody's happy. So now if this was TFTs, we could run each one of them to a separate, to a separate call and provide different temperatures going out to the system, but this now requires us to start breaking ZZZRs because of the piping and the number of zones that we have in it. So it gets pretty crazy, right? So, and by the way, Greg Super, if you want these, of course, they'll be on the recorder version. If you need something special sent to you, I can send it to you. Or if you drop me an email, S-K-W-I-E-L-A-N-D at NTI Boilers and tell me which ones you want, of course, I'll send them to you. Um, I can send them to you in Visio or as a JPEG or a PDF. Anyway, um, on we go. So now, I believe the next one's going to be the, holy fuck, this set the world on fire. So now you guys have seen the primary secondary. You've seen a cast iron boiler go to a primary look. You've seen that all the zones are satisfied. You've seen me do three different temperatures, four actually, on a, on a high temperature, low temperature, mid temperature, and snow melt. You've seen Enderex, you've seen all this shit, very easy wiring, very easy troubleshooting. And we designed this system, it's installed, it's gonna be phenomenal, and he got crucified on the internet. We need 300,000 BTU to provide enough heat for these S80s. So far, so good. So we need to have both these tied into both of these. It's the only way it's going to work is so that this can all go. We're going through a low loss header. We put our expansion tank on the return side for the boilers because we're pumping away to the boilers. Off we go. Da 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 da. Having a great time. Now, we only need 19 gallon a minute going out to the system at a 20 degree delta. All of these zones added up using two closely spaced T's. You add all these up, and they're less than 19 gallons. These zones are running at a 10 degree delta T. So if I'm sending out 140 degree water, I'm only bringing back 130. 
and we're not dropping the temperature as it's swinging by here at 19 gallon a minute, that little bit of water coming back ain't doing shit. And add, add to this that the difference between zone one and the last zone, count them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 zones. 15 zones, three SR506 is going to this, so we have spares. One end switch coming back to the boiler. This circulator is going to the boiler. This circulator is going to the boiler. Look at the money we saved in controls here. End wiring. And this zone is just flying. And the only time I'm going to drop temperature to this last zone is in a catastrophic situation that this house drops and all the radiant and all the floors drop to 40 degrees. For the first six hours, this last zone's gonna be about 15 degrees off. Who gives a shit? This is just gonna be flying on through. Every zone's gonna be happy. It's amazing. So I hope, I hope you understand why we do it this way. I can go back and say, you know, you can always do it this way. You can always go back to this way. You can go one step further back and say, oh, where is it? Nope, don't have it. I got to go one more the other way. Go in the wrong direction. You can use the S, if you have six zones, you can use the controls built into the TFTN and put multiples up. You can, you can have everything tied into that. If you only need one boiler to do your indirect, you can have six boilers there and the six boiler can be doing the indirect and all the other five boilers can be doing heating. You have no problem and you can do it this way with the low loss header. Everybody in the world of fucking internet can be happy and rejoice uh, and this is great. And, this, but, is, this, is, this is a great way. This is a great way. I love this. Button. If you only have six zones, it's a fabulous way. If you have more than six zones, you're kind of fucked. Well, like and you if said, you need both, well, you know, like you said earlier, you said that you went out in your first setup on a cascade with the new boiler, and it was so it was so nice because you can schedule it. You can go through the scheduling. You can see when it comes on, even for a recirculation loop, you can schedule it. That is huge, Steve. That's freaking huge. Hey, look who it is, Daddy. How you doing? Hi, Ted. <laughs> You're That's muted. Ted's look up, turning on the right microphone. Yeah, making sure it's right. I'm a, yeah, I'm a victim of Hilton. Nobody knows what to do anymore if the computer isn't working. <laughs> oh, they're lost. 25 people waiting to check in and nobody knows no what to do. Oh my God, the line was out the door. Holy God. Unbelievable. Where are so you let at? me finish this up real quick. Let me let, let me go back and finish this up real quick before we hear about Ted's hotel tell nightmare. And I'm glad you're here, Ted. But anyway, yeah. so this is great if you have six zones, two boilers. This is great if you have a cast iron boiler and you want to do multiple temperatures, outdoor reset, and you want to be able to have a tech mark control to bring the temperature up for the indirect water heater. This is great if you're doing multiple temperatures, couple zones, you need a couple boilers, you need that the boilers for the indirects. We keep going, and of course, with any loop system, if you're using a primary loop, again, we're going back to that original primary loop for the cast iron boilers. The colder the temperature that you need, the further away it should be from the primary, just to be safe, so that this cold water is not reducing the temperature going into here. And this is just going to work fabulously. We have full redundancy using, using two boilers. We're satisfying two S80s. We put in more storage to make up for the lower BTU. We're running at 19 gallon a minute round to the zones. And this zone, this system is just gonna run phenomenally. So anyway, that was my last point, Ted. Back to your hotel, you finally in your room, huh? I'm, well, yeah, yeah, I'm in my room now. So I, I, I missed this though. This looks like, uh... This looks like uh, Fury's primary, secondary. So doesn't that temperature get reduced each time? Boom, 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 boom. Well, boom. no, Ted, because these are all running at 10 degree delta T. I made it 19 gallon a minute going through the primary loop, running at a 20 degree delta T. So that'll be ripping. We put the highest temperature radiant zone here, the lowest temperature here, and the difference in temperature is only 10 degrees, which, based on physics and the flow rates, 
while this is running, the difference in temperature here is only going to be 10 degrees. So mm -hmm. if all zones are calling, and you know when you get this many zones, the chances of them all calling is slim and none. Yeah, it's pretty good. So, and the nice thing is we have redundancy. What's that? Can you go back to that first picture? That that one that you backed up to at the start of this last conversation here. Back back. The one where you said, you know, if if you're six, you're good. Oh, keep going back, Steve. No, this is six and good. You talk okay. This is using the TFTN zone control. Right. So the the point actually here is you're not limited to six zones. You're limited to six. Temperature controlled. Completely controlled, independent. That's right. Reset and and temperature range, but every single one of these could then branch off to however many. In other words, these these are more than just zones. These you control priority. You control delta T. You control. Yeah, exactly. Whether it's high temperature, low temperature, what your range is, right? But be, above and beyond, these are just circulators going out to something. At this point, every one of these could go out to a zone control. Our and zone control. If you had oh, you could have you could have eight zone valves on each one of these. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So you're, you're really not limited to six zones here. You're limited but to six zone zones. completely configure. That's right. You, you could probably, I mean, this is the the good thing about the TFTN is you got that, you got the features where you could, number one, do your delta T, time the pump. You're going to give it priority settings. When you give it a priority setting, that's going to take that level. I mean, Uncle Steve could, he, I see what he did here. He showed the six zones and he showed his external control. Makes sense to me. But like you said, you can do additional zones, just break off these separate zones into other yeah. little zones. These, every one of these has a has its own unique characteristics, yes, theoretically. Exactly. Its own so zone. As soon as you were grouping what happens downstream of this with the same sort of characteristics, any one of these could have multiple zones coming off. And, and so, so the other reason I like this picture, and I got to give you credit on this picture, is because this is showing you upstream and downstream. I like those options. So guys understand the difference. That's the other thing with upstream and downstream tanks. This is perfect. But like he said, you know, you got you can you can really design well, do whatever. It's just pushing my mind because I did a, a whole thing today for hours. Um, and and we talked about zones and, and what they actually mean if you come off, let's say, the TFT with the with the external zone control. It's a misnomer when we call it a zone control, because really what it's doing is it's adding to what the boiler does. That's a lot more than a zone. It is. But remember, you're you're only going to get the true features of that control if you're using it with the TFTN. You're not going to get it with the other boilers like you would with the TFTN. Well, I thought we were talking about a TFTN here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it's great. That's a great picture he shows. I, I think it's so. Right. As I started, as I started this evening saying, or in the emails I've sent, you have six guys in a room. We could all be hydronic designers, and you'll get six answers. Damn right, you and will. and it's amazing that we can do all the above, and it's amazing that they all work because. Yeah. You, we've That's been doing actually, it for years this way. That's the great thing about hydronics is there's more than one way to skin the cat. And and it's not necessarily one, only one is good and the rest are not so good. Like you can you if, if you if you're dealing with qualified hydronicists, you can go in six different boiler rooms and it'll be set up six different ways, and every one of them will work fine. What do I always say? With hydronic, you have a lot more options than you do with warm air. What's that? Like I always say in my trainings, you have a lot more options with hydronics than you do with warm air. You're limited to warm air applications. Hydronics, you can do things like 
If you want to go to a heating coil, if you want to go to a uh, radiant application, you want to go to a high temperature, low temperature application, you have a world of options you can do where you can't do that warm air. I'm telling you, the, the hydronics is the way to go. Well, we're also a boiler company too. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's, um, we all have our own ways and I like to go simple and not have multiple controls doing multiple things and multiple wires. I design it the way Ted did it in some application that I designed it in, in uh, let me get back to here. So this is great using multiple zones and I could always draw that out. Um, I've done this yeah. hundreds of times. That's I've done good. this hundreds of times. So, I mean, I've done they that. all work. I've done it with quite so many, uh, quite so many branches, but the theory, works fine as long as you understand that the very first one's going to get marginally warmer water than the very last one and it and oh. you, the correct the correct word the keyword there is marginally well that's why i said it <laughs> when the when the delta t is figured correct and the flow on the primary loop is correct it just doesn't fucking matter well right. and here, here's but, Ellie, this picture right yeah, here it has everything yeah. and and you said it multiple times i just want to make sure everybody's hearing it when it's figured correctly this is it right here i mean if you look at this this has everything you freaking need from protections on the boiler magnets he's got the eye valve i mean you got world of options here that is going to make that system efficient and that's see that's the key right there make your system efficient and that that does it i like how you put the boiler mag in there get credit on that one oh, so that it's was, it's that fun guys i we could we could there there was a day when we used to have a thing called wetheads conference and, and ted remembers the wethead conferences oh, yeah. and Multiple. they were head but they were they were they were headed off by dan hollahan we all love dan dan we've all known him for years my my license plate is now because of dan and um by the way my license plates pump away um and we would all get together and you'd have oh 100 150 200 wet heads, hydronic guys in a room where all we do is hydronics. And and Dan, if you could put on the wall, this is what I need. You got 10 of this, five of this, and four of this, and this is your power source or your boiler source, design it. And we would all draw it. it, it some would be the, relatively the same, but in the entire room, you'd have 14, 15, 20, 30 different ways to do it. And they all worked and they were all successful for us. So I look at simplicity for wiring. I look at simplicity for piping. I look for simplicity in space. I look at simplicity for boilers. I look at simplicity to be able to service. And, you know, and, and Ted's way uh, on the on the six zone panel that we had using multiple, multiple temperatures, multiple zones, zone valves coming off. It's great, and the wiring's not that bad. But it's more wiring back to the boiler. I didn't mean to confuse the issue, Steve. I apologize. Oh, no, 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 I no. I, no I, I don't disagree. I just, I just wanted people to understand that if we're really coming off the TFT, it's, it's actually doing a disservice to TFTN. Pardon me. It's, it's doing these, these a disservice to simply. Think of them as a zone because there's yes. so much more that every one of these can be programmed to do. It could be six zone panels and six yeah. circulator. It, could it be. doesn't matter. You know, so it's it's it just showing, and I'm glad Ted you came in and brought that up because it's so greatly just just supports the fact that I was saying when you came up with a whole nother way to do it that and what to use the zones for it's so drove home the fact that you can do this a hundred different ways and still be right you know so, let's say you've got a house you've got a house that has let's say maybe a slab in the basement right so you've got tube and a slab you've got uh oh i don't know maybe uh over the subfloor on the on the first level with heat plates you've got oh i don't know an air handler uh, up in the bedrooms on the second floor, you've got some towel bars in the bathrooms. Every single one of these could be controlling and, and programmed to, to, to 
So you've got the right temperature, you've got the right delta T, you've got the right priority, all programmed in. So it's not like just a dumb zone where you get a demand and it comes on, right? It it it's feeding information back to the to the boiler and receiving information from the boiler. And that boiler can give you distinct temperatures across the board and shut the and and by priority shut any one of the six circulators off based on how you program it. So exactly. if you have a high temperature zone that needs that needs to be satisfied or or four air handlers that need to be satisfied one circulator you can turn all the other zones, all the other pumps off. The zone valves can be open, but turn the pumps off while it's having a great time with the with the with the air handlers. Yep. It's um so it all depends. I guess what it comes down to, it depends on what you're trying to do and your final. But in this particular job that I have on the screen, myself and the contractor got together and discussed everything that was going on. They designed their on-center distances so that all these zones were plus or minus 10%. The coolest of all of them, which is still only 10% off this year, we designed the primary loop so there's no more than a 10% drop in temperature going out. He saved mixing valves. I, we had somebody chime in and says, oh, that should be a high temperature loop and you should have you know, 18 thermostatic three-way valves in. And, and folks, I'm a live and breathe and you can crucify me all you want. If you want to use a thermostatic valve, get the fuck out of here. You can use that for a bathroom. A bathroom. If you're going bigger than that, let's be serious. Let's get some real controls in there because the pressure drop across a three-way thermostatic valve at two gallon a minute is is will increase the size of your pump dramatically. So please, if you're thinking of using thermostatic three ways, thermostatic valves. Well said, that. I mean. Why why use a modulating condensing boiler on outdoor reset if you're gonna put in thermostatic valves where you have the valve for design condition and all you get is one temperature out of it? That's stupid. You you're you're <laughs> defeating the whole purpose of the goddamn boiler, damn it. Exactly. It's obvious to use thermal regulation to be efficient. Who said yeah? I'm glad I got I mean, these. understand thermostatic valves when we were talking about cast iron boilers that operated at a single temperature and you need to protect the boiler. But they have no business in today's condensing world. No way in hell. No. It, it's, that's that's asinine to say that. It's like eliminate your boiler. It's um I, I still am amazed that people will sucks. buy a condensing Ooh, boiler and then put it through a a, a two hundred dollar three thermostatic valve on it. When in reality, when thermostatic valves were sixty bucks, it still didn't make sense. But now that they're not cheap anymore, and there's a constant twenty two degree delta T across the supply and return, it's just stupid. I don't understand it, especially now that there's such things as the I valve out there that you can get in two way, three way, or four way that 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 don't even need to talk to the boiler. They just watch the temperature, well, you, and they have a great time, full flow through them. They're amazing. You just, you just said yeah. something. 20 degree delta t how are you going to get the efficiency you need to get that boiler to reach its dew point if you're only giving it 20 freaking degrees let's get that cold water to come back let it shock that heat exchanger absorb that latent heat condense like that's just that whoever said that mm. well and the other thing is i said i mean is that you have to set it for whatever the design temperature requires it's, it's, that zone is. And that's it's, it's People who don't do the design work or people who do it, try to do it cheaply. And we'll provide more comfort with more energy savings doing it by any of our three ways. And I say that because you guys are vertically on my screen. I might have to go this way because people are looking at us across the way. But you can walk away and they all work. Which one's going to be more efficient and easier service, right? That's that's, that's Service right and troubleshooting is huge. Easy to service. Easy to service. You hit it right there. Easy to service. Go back. You have to replace ten different controls when you can go ahead and do one. It's simple. Don't don't go in and over. Don't overcomplicate it. And listen, guys, you got to learn how to test. You can't go in and say, "Hey, that's four sections." You got to break out the ruler, measure it out. Go doors and windows, measure everything out. Do it right because I'm telling you, at the end of the day, if you don't, you're not gonna. It's not gonna work right. It. I, I'm just saying, you got to test. You got to test. Even when you go to a service call, test. Break your analyzer out. Break your freaking meter out. That's what they're there for. Not there to sit in your bag. Yeah, yeah it's Segment. fun. So, so just know there's not one way to skin a cat. If Amen. you handed us 
Right. If you put us all, if you put all of us in a room, and if we were all artists, <laughs> and you put and you put a bowl of fruit in the center center of the room and said, everybody draw it. We'd all draw it and it would all work. It would all look like a bowl of fruit, but all the pictures will not look the same. We do the same in hydronics. We all ask what you want to get. We all ask what the flow rates are. I love when somebody calls me up and says, can you design this for me? And I say, what are your flow rates? And they go, I don't know. And I say, well, I can't help you. But if I know the flows, if we know the temperatures, if we know what the customer wants, if we know what you want, like redundancy and domestic hot water, and, and we can design anything for you guys. And it will work, no matter how it looks. I have often marveled at Ted Lowe's, I mean, Ted and I go back a long way to the early days of Radiant. And 45. we both designed things totally different. I've learned a lot from Ted. I'm sure Ted has maybe has learned a, one or two things from me. And but but through the years we've worked all our jobs are successful, and and that's what you got to look at. And the guys who argue are guys who don't know. <laughs> this all started Ted because someone was crucifying this particular job on the screen, out on the internet. Oh really? That, yeah. that the guy posted he that believe me the contractor if you saw his copper work. You would have a, a um, you wouldn't be able to get up from your desk. How's that? Um, Tell me his name. It was again. amazing, amazing work, and and somebody threw him under the bus. And I'm like, there's no need. And I wasn't going to respond until they threw me under the bus. Yeah. Then you. Then now you I have to respond. Gloves. Yeah. That's what <laughs> you send me their address. <laughs> and I was I was all good till you brought me into the fight. You brought me into the fight. Now gloves are off. Exactly. Up, baby. Yeah, but right. As, that system can work as, all the time. As, uh, as, uh, as Mr. Right. Bear, as, as Mr. Bear said, as Mr. Bear said in his book, "Hug your haters." When you're on social media, you respond twice. If the person goes for a third round, they're just looking for an argument. Walk away. Like Machiavelli. So, said, for those of you who are listening, because there's still a ton of you guys on here. If you're in social media and the argument goes past two responses, the person just wants an argument. Just walk away. Just walk away. Or read Jeff Bear's book, um, Hug Your Haters. I'll hug them for you. Oh, yeah. That's just <laughs> it's a great drawing. I, like the you I love the tags. They're dropping parallel, baby. They're never going to run out What are you saying? You love the what? I love your tank arrangement there. I love the way the tanks are piped there. They're going to last forever. They will never run out of hot water. Come on. That guy don't know drawings. It's uh, it's just going to be an amazing system. Anyway, with that said, let me get this off. Uh, Thanks for watching the video today. If you'd like to check out more videos, see the link below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for all the future updates. And also check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram.